Asmodeus, also known as Asmodei in Infernal, is the Faerunian god of indulgence and a patron of oppression and power. He is the supreme devil and ruler of all devils, serving as the lord of the ninth layer and overlord of the nine hells. From his throne in the deepest part of the nine hells of Beator, the Lord of Lies rules over a realm characterized by relentless tyranny, ongoing warfare, and political scheming while pursuing his sinister agenda to dominate not just the nine hells, but all of existence. Asmodeus' true appearance is that of a gigantic serpent with scales stretching for a long distance and leaking acid black blood from ancient wounds. This massive size prevents personal interactions prompting him to use humanoid avatars or spells to project his image. These avatars appear as tall, handsome, red-skinned humanoids with horns, glowing red eyes, and meticulously groomed beards, dressed in lavish red and black attire. Asmodeus embodies lawful evil and is a master strategist with unmatched planning skills that span centuries and affect the entire multiverse. His complex and secretive plans keep even his closest followers in suspense. He uses the forces of evil strategically in his extensive and subtle manipulations, which include both divine beings and mortals. Known for his persuasive speaking skills, Asmodeus is the most courteous of the archdevils, always appearing calm and rational despite his suffering. He lures others to serve him with promises of great rewards, only to use them as pawns in his darker plans. Ultimately, Asmodeus represents the epitome of evil using torture and secrets as tools to dominate and control. In his view, only he possesses the necessary strength, wisdom, and charm to lead the multiverse toward a perfect order as he sees it. His quest for absolute power involves overcoming not just rival demons from the abyss whose influence threatens his rule, but also the naive forces of good. His self-assured and competent nature has enabled him to survive numerous plots against him and maintain his supremacy in the infernal hierarchy of the Nine Hells. Legend has it that Asmodeus attributes his wicked deeds to necessity and the mandates of law, citing the rules of hell in his defense and arguing that his contracts are never broken. He contends that the souls he harvests ultimately serve the noble purpose of protecting the cosmos. Asmodeus highlights the sanctity of law as the differentiating factor between himself and the demons of the abyss. He argues that without him and his devils defending it, the multiverse would be overrun by demon kind, leading to its eventual destruction. While Asmodeus is considered one of the ultimate powers of law, he does not uphold the rules out of respect. Despite asserting that his actions are necessary to prevent chaos and preserve the forces of good, this is merely a facade to conceal his true intentions. In reality, Asmodeus views the abyss as a useful distraction and plans to destroy the upper planes, possibly utilizing demon kind to achieve this goal. Ironically, his ultimate plan involves embracing chaos, withholding the power of law, and letting the world collapse, after which he would remake reality according to his desires. To Asmodeus, law is merely a tool for bending others to his will. He sees civilization as a means of gaining power with social structures and technology serving as instruments to crush his enemies. Chaos facilitates easy conquest, and conquering allows him to exert control over others. Asmodeus uses tradition for protection and wording as a weapon, appealing to the letter of the law and framing his deeds as upholding the natural laws of the cosmos. Despite his belief that he is the multiverse's chosen protector, his ultimate dedication lies in obtaining absolute authority for himself even if it means breaking every law in existence. Despite his cunning and charisma, he is not intellectually invincible. While he may feign foreknowledge and act as if everything is going according to plan, he can be surprised and feel threatened, especially by figures whose power and influence rival his own. Additionally, despite his outward manners, Asmodeus is capable of fury, occasionally losing his temper and revealing the evil that lies beneath his facade of civility. The true form of Asmodeus is a subject shrouded in uncertainty. Even the devils residing in Nessus, his stronghold, can't confirm whether the serpent's coil, purported to hold his true form, was created from the spiraling body of a fallen Asmodeus. Those who possess knowledge of its existence and its alleged origins rarely live beyond a day, yet it remained documented in ancient and scarcely accessible libraries like Demogorgon's Citadel of Abyssum. 
regarding the implications of this form on his origin tales. The fact that he currently possessed a serpentine shape doesn't necessarily mean he was always thus. It is believed that even devils could be subject to the torments of the hells, potentially causing physical transformations in Asmodeus, or he may have been cursed by a former superior. Asmodeus's origins are a mystery, surrounded by rumors that hint at a deeper truth he may prefer to keep hidden. He is acknowledged as the oldest among the archdevils, though some tales suggest he might be overshadowed by the forgotten figures of Lucifer or the enigmatic Satan. Comparisons are drawn between Asmodeus and Zophkiel, the ancient ruler of the Archons and the Seven Heavens of Mount Celestia, both shrouded in inscrutability and age, with Zophiel being one of the earliest martyrs for the cause of lawful good. According to some fiendish accounts, Asmodeus owes his existence to the actions of others. Demon histories claim that the Batezu arose from larvae after the general of Gehenna infused them with lawfulness he stripped from his own people, banishing them from Hades to Beator, where they evolved into the Batezu, guided by the Yugoloths. Conversely, the demonic Tanari assert the devil kind originated from them, viewing the Batezu as corrupted reflections of themselves, chaos twisted into law. This disagreement is perhaps the only point of consensus among the histories of the Abyss, and some interpretations suggest it may hold truth. Certain theories propose that Asmodeus plays a fundamental role in shaping reality itself, with his very existence shaping the multiverse as we understand it. He is speculated to predate the established beliefs about the planes, belonging to a league of ancient beings known as the Ancient Brethren. If these rumors hold any truth, he would likely be linked to the Bernaloths, Yugoloths rumor to precede the current configuration of the planes and credited with the creation of ancient fiendish races. Alternate versions of the Yugoloth narrative suggest that the Lords of the Nine were either appointed by the Bernaloths or emerged out of necessity as a result of the multiverse's nature. In the majority of his origin stories, whether expelled from celestial realms, banished from other fiendish hierarchies, or spurned by timeless peers, Asmodeus has experienced a fall from grace. Despite this disgraced and often misunderstood status, he has begun to ascend once more, executing plans forged over countless eons. There are three recorded origin narratives. The first story begins in the earliest epics of the cosmos, when reality existed as an indistinct, swirling mass of boundless potential, simultaneously encompassing everything and nothing. From this chaos, various forms emerged, ranging from entire dimensions to godlike entities, some embracing the nascent reality while others rejected it, giving rise to a faction of law. The fledgling multiverse was shaped by the clash between these ancient forces of chaos and law, among which were the twin cosmic serpents embodying the duality of law, the noble Jazirian adorned with feathers, and the sinister Ahriman with a forked tongue. Together they stood as law's mightiest champions, unified despite their differences, and dedicated foremost to upholding order. By forming an Ouroboros, biting each other's tails, and extending their coils into the infinite chaos, the cosmic serpents encircled the Outlands, a realm of true neutrality born from the interaction of law, good, chaos, and evil. Around this central hub, other alignment-based planes took shape, creating the Great Ring, known as the Outer Planes. In establishing this foundational ring, the twin serpents introduced the fundamental planar principle, the unity of rings, emphasizing the significance of rings in the philosophy and geography of the planes. Recognizing the need for a third law to complete the triumvirate, the twin serpents sought to define a central point of reality around which to coil. Yet they diverged in their adherence to law, each advocating for their favorite planes of heaven or hell to hold this honor, while disregarding more neutral options like the Outlands. Their conflicting desires led to a struggle that shattered the Ouroboros and severed their tails, disrupting the unity of law and leaving reality without a defined center. As a consequence, the envisioned bordered planes extended infinitely, effectively conceding to chaos as the third law. Jazirian, with wings, ascended to Mount Celestia, where drops of blood scattered from his wounds gave rise to fully formed coatls, while Ahriman, lacking wings, descended into Beator, embracing his dark offspring. Weakened by their conflict and the exertion of power in shaping the planes, they were surpassed by other godlike entities as the multiverse became populated by mortal and immortal beings. Eventually forgotten by the wider multiverse, 
few survived from the early days of creation to recall their identities. Ahriman capitalized on this anonymity, concealing his true nature and reinventing himself as the Lord of Beator, adopting the name Asmodeus, from which he would scheme to reclaim his lost glory. The next story is called by the scholars, The Pact Primeval. The Pact Primeval is a myth that spreads across all realms in the material plane, with various cultural adaptations altering the rules of the involved deities. Devils recount this tale, which stands as the most widely embraced narrative of the multiverse's genesis. According to this rendition, preceding the dawn of existence, chaos reigned supreme, birthing demons as its tangible manifestations. Devoid of the concept of time, demons engaged in ceaseless conflict within an environment of perpetual disorder for immeasurable duration. However, this chaotic state became untenable for the fabric of reality. Thus, forces of order emerged from the chaos to combat it and its demonic spawn, embodying early deities adorned in radiant armor of unyielding stability and wielding weapons forged from idealized thought. For Epox, the forces of law clashed with chaos until the deities of order, weary of the eternal struggle, sought to pursue other endeavors, such as crafting worlds and sentient beings. Consequently, they created a diverse legion of winged champions, blessed with divine magic to wage war on their behalf, the angels. Among them, Asmodeus emerged as the bravest, strongest, and most beautiful. He distinguished himself by slaying more demons than any other being, be they angel or deity. However, as time elapsed, he and his cohort gradually assumed demonic traits to better combat their adversaries, thereby giving rise to devils from demons. Eventually, Asmodeus's celestial kin, horrified by their transformation, implored the gods to banish him. Yet during the trial, Asmodeus, citing the primacy of law in combating chaos, defended himself using the very laws he helped to craft. Despite his grotesque appearance, he refused exile, arguing that the sacrifice ensured the purity of others. Unable to find a lawful means to thwart Asmodeus, the gods watched helplessly as his host, with their alarming demonic features, continued their incursions into newly formed worlds. Unable to prevent Asmodeus's entry into their creations, the distraught deities turned their attention to fashioning mortals and magnificent realms to harbor them. Unfortunately, Asmodeus's forces were called upon to repel invading demon hordes, proving largely successful. Collaboratively, barriers were erected to shield the material plane from demonic intrusion, spanning walls, mountains, icy expanses, and vast oceans. Yet akin to Asmodeus's influence, these newly formed worlds bore scars in service to the law. To their dismay, the gods discovered that mortals promptly sought to undermine these barriers, unwittingly allowing demonic forces to breach their paradises once more. Asmodeus approached the gods in response to their complaints, acknowledging the importance of mortals' free will to choose obedience to the law. However, he pointed out that mortals, driven by curiosity, often succumb to demonic promises of freedom, ultimately leading to anarchic destruction. As a solution, Asmodeus argued that voluntary obedience must be met with consequences, asserting that the law held no weight without punishment. To illustrate his point, he revealed punishment itself, fashioned as a formidable sword, reportedly of his own creation. Asmodeus contended that criminals must suffer as a deterrent to others, the few enduring punishment to exemplify the consequences. His logic was flawless, earning him greater recognition among the gods. This discourse also led to the acknowledgement of the cosmic principles of good and evil, further dividing the gods based on their alignment. Those who incline towards evil pledged to support Asmodeus, while those favoring good distanced themselves. Despite the gods' dissemination of knowledge regarding punishment for sins, transgressors arrived in their realm to face lawful retribution, orchestrated by Asmodeus and his allies. The agonizing cries of the damned filled the celestial realms, prompting Asmodeus to propose a solution, to create a secluded realm, later known as Beator, where his followers could carry out torment without the gods' interference. Eager to be rid of Asmodeus, the gods agreed to his departure on the condition of a pact. Asmodeus presented a ruby rod of power and a document ensuring that he and his forces would execute divine will, dictating the fate of the damned and granting them access to soul's magic. Though some gods harbored suspicion, Asmodeus assured them of its benefits, preventing their independence while still harnessing magic from souls. The ancient deities of law signed the Pact Primeval, establishing Hell's boundaries 
and the rules of damnation. As Modius and his Aranyes' companions descended into the desolate and barren landscape of Beator, where he shared his plans with his followers amidst their lamentations, over many mortal years, the gods of law and good enjoyed their purified realms, only to realize a troubling decrease in incoming souls. Consultation with their clergy revealed that Asmodeus' forces, then referred to as devils, were actively corrupting mortals. A swift divine delegation discovered that Beator had been transformed into nine tiers of terror, where souls were harvested for power and transformed into mindless creatures to bolster a devil army. When questioned about this corruption, Asmodeus simply cited the strict interpretation of the law with a smirk. Although many suggested that Asmodeus had outmaneuvered his divine adversaries with the Pact Primeval, no mortal has ever laid eyes on it. Like many legends, it was riddled with contradictions and vague details, with alternative versions acknowledged despite its widespread acceptance. Moreover, the legend appears to be heavily biased in favor of Asmodeus, particularly in one specific aspect. If the story were to be believed in its entirety, Asmodeus' departure after signing the pact was not as smooth as depicted. In reality, he was physically cast into Beator by the gods after pledging to dwell there. His descent caused upheaval, with some versions suggesting that the plane itself fractured and reformed into the nine layers as he plummeted. Despite the violent descent, Asmodeus ultimately landed in the deepest parts of Beator, known as the Pit, where he nurses his wounds and plots his schemes beneath the bleeding plane. The final myth is called He Who Was. The deity at the center of the myth, known as He Who Was, remained nameless, as even the Codex of Betrayal, authored by the last worshiper, lacked the god's name. Asmodeus, utilizing his magic and influence, expunged all knowledge of his name, leaving only titles like He Who Was or He Who Once Lit Our Way. Only a few mortal scholars retain the name, but it was rumored that Asmodeus dispatched powerful devils to silence anyone who dared utter it, even in modern times. He who was once held immense power as the ruler of the celestial realm of Bathion, a domain founded on law, guided by morality, and dedicated to fostering peace. He was revered as a god of kingship, the sky, wisdom, and possibly knowledge, with some accounts suggesting he was the creator of humanity. However, conflicting portrayals described him as both a benevolent but ineffectual leader, unable to handle the brutality of war, and as a self-righteous deity who endorsed cruelty and violence through his avenging angels. Some speculated that this behavior might have prompted Asmodeus' rebellion, viewing him as a cautionary example of succumbing to one's own vices. Despite these interpretations, he who was permitted his archangels to wield significant power intending to use them to spread peace and justice across the multiverse. Among these powerful exarchs was Asmodeus. During the ancient dawn war between law and chaos, Asmodeus, along with other deific figures, was tasked with guarding the prison of Thara's Dune after the defeat of the Queen of Chaos and the expulsion of demons. However, Pazuzu, a demon with secret ambitions, manipulated Asmodeus by flattering him and sowing seeds of vanity and arrogance. This manipulation led Asmodeus to believe himself superior to his deity, ultimately causing his fall from grace. Turning away from his responsibilities, Asmodeus ventured into the Blood Rift, a perilous realm where he achieved what no other had dared before. He reached the Abyss's core in its unfathomable depths. There he appropriated a fragment of the Abyss's dark heart, which further entrenched evil's hold on him and eventually led to the transformation of him and his followers into devils. It was speculated that during his time in the Abyss, Asmodeus was drawn to the influence of Pale Knight, and rumors circulated that he might even be the father of Grazd. Over time, the tactics employed by the greatest general of He Who Was became increasingly ruthless, resulting in the deaths of innocents alongside enemies. A rift developed between Asmodeus and his deity, culminating in He Who Was stripping Asmodeus of his position. Rather than executing him, the merciful deity left Asmodeus and his followers broken on the fringes of his realm, hoping he would repent for his disobedience and pride. However, Asmodeus' arrogance outweighed any remorse he might have felt. He and his followers embraced their shattered forms, and the fallen angel plotted revenge against the gods, who had forgotten his sacrifices in the war, including his former master. At a critical juncture in the conflict, 
where the gods appeared to be faltering, Asmodeus led a rebellion alongside his allies, wielding the shard of the abyss, now forged into a ruby rod to slay his deity. But Asmodeus's triumph was short-lived, as his victory transformed into damnation through the dying curse, he who was. The once paradisical realm of Bathion was obliterated by infernal flames, leaving behind only desolation and torment in Beator. The fallen angels, including Asmodeus, were subject to the full force of Hell's power, their encampment becoming the focal point of the curse, engulfing them in agonizing flames. Distorted physically and eventually transformed into devils, they were condemned to remain trapped in Beator, unable to access the full divine power of their slain god. Asmodeus is technically considered a deity, although his exact status is a matter of ongoing debate and has evolved over time. While some view him as the strongest archdevil, others argue that he may not even qualify as a fully-fledged god, possessing only the powers of a lesser deity. More recent interpretations even elevate him to the status of a greater god, with some portraying him as a primal embodiment of evil or a metaphysical serpent concept. Some extreme portrayals liken him to an overgod akin to the Lady of Pain. Unlike typical deities, his strength remains constant regardless of the number of worshippers, and he lacks the ability to bestow spells upon his followers. However, those who become disciples of darkness can circumvent this limitation, albeit by channeling the divine magic of Beator rather than directly accessing Asmodeus' powers as their patron. Previously appeasing Asmodeus with sentient sacrifices was crucial for maintaining a mortal soul, but this changed after Asmodeus ascended to true godhood by consuming Azuth, allowing him to grant spells to his followers without such vile rituals. Even before his ascent to godhood, Asmodeus possessed the ability to create up to ten avatars, though his capacity to do so was limited. He could only send one avatar to the prime material plane at a time, preventing him from maintaining multiple avatars simultaneously. As the master of the Nine Hells, Asmodeus wields absolute control over his domain, able to alter the landscape of any layer and manipulate the forms of the Archdevils at will. It remains uncertain whether he can eliminate Archdevils with a mere thought, although suspicions arise regarding instances such as the sudden demise of the Hag Countess. Like other authoritative devils, he has the power to demote or promote devils at his discretion, and he alone holds the authority to elevate a devil to Archdevil status. He also serves as the foundational authority behind infernal contracts, making any breach punishable by consigning the Oathbreaker's soul to the Nine Hells. His avatar possesses a vast array of spells. In addition, once per day, the avatar can cast any power word spell, symbol spell, meteor swarm, true resurrection, and wish. It also possesses the spellcasting abilities of a master cleric with the diabolic and evil domains. When in Hell, the Avatar can cast virtually any spell through sheer will alone. Asmodeus's Avatar is impervious to harm from spells below a certain power level, as well as poison, paralysis, petrification, death-related magic, illusions, and attempts to influence its mind. Physical attacks must be made with weapons enchanted to at least plus four to have any effect, and wounds inflicted upon the Avatar heal immediately unless they are caused by holy or blessed means. The Avatar admits an awe effect, making it exceedingly difficult for foes to muster the will to attack unless provoked. The Avatar's gaze induces a combined slow and fear effect within a short range, weakening opponent's physical strength and combat power. Its voice carries an irresistible suggestion, rendering those lacking extraordinary willpower subservient for periods ranging from 10 to 100 days. Asmodeus prefers to subjugate or drive away adversaries rather than kill them outright utilizing these abilities to coerce submission or retreat. If necessary, he can summon pit fiends or other devilish creatures to deal with adversaries. Each of his avatars wields a ruby rod of Asmodeus, serving as both a badge of office and a primary weapon. The rod can unleash elemental forces, induce fear in enemies, or provide healing and protection. In combat situation, the avatar relies primarily on the powers of the ruby rod rather than its innate abilities. Asmodeus possesses one of the original copies of the Pact Primeval, which he zealously guards to maintain the foundation of his and the Devil's authority to condemn mortals. To prevent its removal from Beator, he encased the document in a massive ruby weighing 20 tons. Within his personal citadel, 
Asmodeus hoards a vast number of souls, which are available for purchase at an exorbitant cost, rumored to be as high as entire kingdoms for a single soul. He governs the entirety of the Nine Hells of Beator, with his principal domain situated in Nessus, the Ninth Layer. According to Devil Law, only Asmodeus possesses the authority to issue letters of safe passage for travel within and between layers, though such permissions are never extended to Nessus. His stronghold, Malshim, stands as a colossal fortress so vast that it defies mapping. Prioritizing his own security and privacy, Asmodeus predominantly operates from within Malshim, delegating tasks and issuing directives through his intermediaries. However, he convenes the other archdevils annually within its walls. Asmodeus' primary objective is to maintain the existing order of Beator, solidifying his position as the supreme ruler of Hell. Beyond this, he endeavors to advance the influence of lawful evil throughout the multiverse, aiming to tip the cosmic scales in its favor. These efforts align with his overarching goal of rectifying the injuries sustained from his ancient fall from grace to restore his full power and instigating Armageddon. This cataclysmic conflict threatens to reshape or even obliterate the current cosmological framework, potentially accelerating Asmodeus' timeline for achieving his ambitions. The key to Asmodeus' rejuvenation lies in souls. Beator derives its divine energy from the torment and degradation of damned souls, a process that sustains and empowers him. While much of this grim work is delegated, particularly to the city of Jangling Hyter in Mineros, Asmodeus reserves some divine power to facilitate his own healing. He has meticulously orchestrated his grand design from within the depths of hell over countless eons. His nefarious agenda operates on multiple fronts, each shrouded in secrecy and understood by only a select few. The Blood War, a perpetual conflict between fiends from the lower plains, serves as a focal point of Asmodeus' machinations. While he did not initiate the war, he has played a significant role in its continuation and escalation. Recognizing the inherent futility of the conflict, Asmodeus nonetheless exploits its perceived importance as a means of distraction and justification for his actions. Despite his outward dismissal, he acknowledges the potential consequences of allowing demonic forces to unify and overrun reality, emphasizing the strategic importance of maintaining the blood war. To maintain his rule, he employs a strategy of keeping potential rivals close entrusting significant authority to those who harbor ambitions of replacing him. The hierarchy of Hell is structured with Hell's nobility, the Archdevils, positioned above the common devils, with the Archdukes governing the first eight layers. Beneath them are their respective courts, comprising Dukes, Princes, Counts, and other nobles, with pit fiends occupying the lowest rank of the upper classes. These lords engage in intricate political schemes, safeguarding themselves against ambitious underlings while vying for higher positions, often forming alliances and betraying one another and other powers in pursuit of dominance. Consequently, Asmodeus's subordinates spend more time contending with each other than challenging his authority. This system also bolsters efforts in the Blood War, as most Archdukes, despite their role as generals, view the conflict as a mundane duty compared to their ambitions of societal corruption and power acquisition. To ensure focus on the Blood War, Asmodeus monitors the Dark Aid closely. Association with other Archdevils obscures his nature and activities, with his key pawns serving as proxy for public expectations of him. Asmodeus maintains a network of spies across the Nine Hells and infiltrates East Archdevil's court, fostering an atmosphere of justified paranoia. He remains vigilant against plots devised against him, utilizing his avatars stationed on each layer of Hell, with an additional one for its extraplanar activities. Although Asmodeus seldom manifests in his avatar on the material plane due to restrictions, he exerts influence indirectly through proxies. He focuses his corrupting efforts on figures of cosmic significance, such as angels or demigods, occasionally enticing them into contracts to augment Hell's forces. Despite his formidable position, Asmodeus cannot afford complacency, as his role necessitates vigilance against internal threats. Notably, even the King of Hell, is subject to the intricate laws of the Nine Hells, exemplified by the Phlegethos-based Diabolical Court, an independent institution rife with constant machinations to establish new rules and precedents. While ultimately answerable to Asmodeus, the Court's decisions are governed by the complex legal code of the Nine Hells, 
obliging him to acknowledge both infractions and technical compliance with the law. Asmodeus has an insatiable appetite for the soul energy of those who have lost faith, particularly targeting individuals of great power. While the divine energy extracted from souls damned to hell can aid in its healing, the souls of unbelievers hold a particular allure for him. He seeks not just atheists, but those who lack belief in any form of divinity, afterlife, or purpose in existence. Souls in this state undergo a unique fate upon death, reforming in Nessus irrespective of alignment, where they are consumed by Asmodeus and excruciating torment until every trace of their essence is obliterated. The exact reason for the rebirth of these souls in Nessus remains unclear, and exceptions to this rule exist. For instance, souls in Toril initially journeyed to Kelimvor's realm before being incorporated into a wall surrounding his city to undergo a similar process of dissolution. It's speculated that unbeliever spirits, devoid of any will, may simply cease to exist upon death. Asmodeus doesn't necessarily need to kill disbelieving souls to absorb their energy. The process can take centuries to render the victim slowly non-existent. Central to Asmodeus' grand design is the perpetuation of the notion that he merely seeks to bring souls into hell. Unbelief serves as his most potent weapon, undermining the gods and subverting hell's rule in the cosmic order. By fostering faithlessness, Asmodeus empowers himself against his adversaries, with other schemes serving as distractions to conceal this true motive. One favorite tactic involves covert support to the Athar of Sigil, a group that rejects the divinity of gods. Asmodeus also actively promotes false religions, providing cleric spells to cults created by his agents on the material plane. These cults may worship an invented deity tailored to a specific demographic or become suicide cults where members lose the will to live. He tarnishes the perceived greatness of the gods by instigating long-running feuds among them, planting ideas in chosen divinities' heads over centuries to provoke conflict. He enjoys impersonating other gods to manipulate mortals and steer them towards his own cults. Even after ascending to true godhood, Asmodeus continues to undermine divinity through his religion. In the aftermath of the spell plague, his faithful offer solace to those questioning the gods' intentions, promising a reprieve in the afterlife and an absolution for transgressions. Though shrines and temples dedicated to him are rare, many seek Asmodeus for forgiveness and protection from their patron's wrath, believing he can conceal their sins after death for a price. He has been depicted in varying ways, as indifferent to worship and as yearning for true divinity. He holds a paradoxical desire for mortal souls, while also maintaining a significant following among them. Despite rarely actively enticing mortals, he exerts an undeniable influence over those who knowingly worship devils. Undoubtedly, Asmodeus reigns supreme among devil worshippers. He's typically the top choice for anyone considering allegiance to devil kind. Practically every known devil worshipper is aligned with him and his cult boasts a far greater number of adherents on the material plane compared to any other archdevil, possibly even surpassing all others combined. Essentially, every diabolic cult is considered a branch of his own, with all leaders mandated to acknowledge his supremacy and pledge allegiance to him. Consequently, mortals who derive power from infernal sources ultimately draw from Asmodeus himself, and he dictates the benefits that archdukes are permitted, even required, to provide. Asmodeus's influence extends across races and societal strata, permeating even the bastions of good. While most of his followers hail from settlements inhabited by humans, halflings, dwarves, elves, and gnomes, there are also adherents among monstrous races. He actively seeks influence among organized, lawful evil humanoid races, such as hobgoblins, with many evil creatures venerating him as the embodiment of might and tyranny. Within his cult, Clerics aspire to wealth, prestige, and above all, power. Cultists view allegiance to Asmodeus as a means to attain great influence, accessing opportunities otherwise beyond their reach. They are often charismatic figures, naturally assuming leadership roles, and may already possess significant political or economic clout, such as merchants and wealthy nobles. The cult functions as a clandestine mutual aid society where members leverage their existing influence and affluence to elevate each other to higher levels of prominence. In societies devoted to Asmodeus, all avenues of advancement, be they political, social, or economic, are intricately tied to membership in the cult. In societies predominantly aligned with lawful evil, Asmodeus's temples are prominent features of the landscape. 
operating openly and without concealment. However, in regions where other alignments prevail, his temples maintain a more discreet presence, keeping their true nature and activities veiled from uninitiated observers. In areas hostile to lawful evil influences, temples are often concealed within subterranean complexes, with the true identity of their god obscured from those who have not yet proven themselves as initiates. Regardless of location, all temples prominently display symbols associated with Asmodeus, employing his ruby-tipped rod emblem for subtlety or his skull-gripping clawed fist in devil-dominated societies with the occasional use of an inverted pentagram. These temples are meticulously appointed and protected, benefiting from Asmodeus's financial and fiendish favor. As he does not have a soul quota of his own, he frequently delegates the establishment of cults to other figures and promotes devotion to fictional entities, as seen in his efforts to inspire faithlessness. Notably, he maintains an intriguing relationship with the cults of his two most powerful rivals, Mephistopheles, despite his frustration, traditionally oversees cults dedicated to Asmodeus, often being mistaken for his master. Conversely, Baal Zabul's cults, known for their power as insurgents rather than governors, occasionally swap temples with Asmodeus's cults, with victorious churches of Baal Zabul being claimed by Asmodeus, while Baal Zabul gains a secret shrine within a target area. Asmodeus also cultivates relationships with mortal spellcasters through unconventional means. Warlocks, particularly those with fiendish blood, are common in the Forgotten Realms, with Asmodeus maintaining the most packs among all the archdevils, second only to Mephistopheles. These packs serve to expand his influence across different planes and reinforce his supremacy. Additionally, he mentors disciples of darkness, individuals driven by a ruthless pursuit of power and world domination. The most adept among them, often existing spellcasters, can draw upon Asmodeus's power and select cult leaders are granted the ability to drain the vitality of their allies, even doing so automatically while unconscious. As formidable as Asmodeus is, he isn't immune to apprehension. Despite his immense power, the notion of facing a united coalition of archdevils unnerves him. Should they overcome their divisions, the collective might of the archdukes could potentially overpower him. To prevent such a scenario, Asmodeus utilizes his adeptness in diplomacy and manipulation to deliberately sow discord, suspicion, and conflict through the hells. He consistently positions himself to appear aligned with the victors in any given conflict. The delicate power dynamics within hell are prone to upheaval, and the downfall of a key lord at an inopportune moment could result in catastrophic consequences spanning the nine hells and beyond. Since achieving godhood during the spell plague, Asmodeus has seen a steady growth in his mortal following. Although his faith is still categorized as devil worship, with humans and demi-humans alike recognizing him as the Lord of the Nine Hells, the practices of his priests, known as the Mordai, have evolved. While they once conducted vile rituals in his name, such actions are no longer necessary to channel his divinity, distinguishing him from the lesser lords of hell. As a true deity, Asmodeus offers a different allure and influence compared to his diabolic persona. He promises a great and immediate reward to those who submit their souls to him, indulging in life's pleasures and offering special favors to those who recruit others into his service. Through authorized intermediaries, he even permits priests to cast true resurrection on the deceased. However, these temptations come at a grave cost, the signatory soul, condemning them to eternal damnation in the nine hells. The Mordai exploit greed and impatience, ensuring that those they corrupt remain bound to Asmodeus as their true ruler, to be obeyed without question. Furthermore, Asmodeus's church actively undermines the divine order. In the wake of his ascension, charismatic figures have emerged, offering solace and answers to a bewildered populace. They provide respite from the agonizing wait for divine response, offering delights, distractions, and companionship with the possibility of concealing one's true transgressions from the eyes of the gods for a price after death. Despite initial resistance, the church has made some progress over the decades, with many individuals turning to Asmodeus for absolution from their sins, even if shrines and temples dedicated to him remain rare. Following the spell plague, Asmodeus and a group of warlocks, known as the Toral Thirteen, performed a ritual, marking all tieflings in the world as his descendants. Regardless of their true lineage, he cursed them to bear his blood, 
transforming them to better resemble him. Even in modern times, he offers transformation into a tiefling with a direct infernal bloodline to himself, but at the cost of the seeker's soul. Despite a common belief, Asmodeus' ritual did not grant him special control over his so-called children. Many tieflings rejected infernal politics or aligned themselves with opposing fiendish factions. Other infernal bloodlines resurface, but those marked by Asmodeus have remained the most numerous. Nonetheless, many tieflings have chosen to follow him, especially since he is the frequent provider of warlock packs to their kind. The presence of Ashmadai, an active cult of Asmodeus in Neverwinter, where the largest tiefling population exists in North Faerun, leads many in the north to believe that all tieflings are servants of Asmodeus. Tieflings are human-based plane-touched, born with the touch of the fiendish plains, often descending from fiends like demons, yugoloths, devils, and evil deities. They are renowned for their cunning and personal charm, making them skilled deceivers and capable leaders when biases are set aside. Despite being several generations removed from their evil ancestors, tieflings still carry the taint. Unlike half-fiends, tieflings aren't inherently predisposed to evil alignments and exhibit a wider range of alignments, much like humans, although they do tend towards deceitfulness. Tieflings often exude an unsettling aura, causing discomfort among people, whether or not they are aware of the tiefling's unsavory ancestry. While some appear as typical humans, many retain physical traits inherited from their ancestors. Common features include horns, tails, prehensile or non, and pointed teeth. Some tieflings have solid orbs for eyes in various colors, while others have human-like eyes. Other unusual characteristics may include a sulfurous odor, cloven feet, or a general aura of unease. Physically, tieflings are similar to humans in many ways. They are typically of similar height and slightly heavier. Tiefling skin usually ranges from human-like colors to reddish hues, and their hair often mirrors human hair colors, although shades of dark blue, red, or purple are also common. While not always the case, tieflings tend to have better reflexes than humans, contributing to their reputation for thievery and deceit. Tieflings born with strikingly inhuman features are often killed at birth by horrified parents or others. Only those with subtle features or born to individuals indifferent to their appearance are likely to survive to adulthood, either due to acceptance or cruel intentions. Tieflings who reach adulthood age at a similar rate to humans and typically have lifespans that are around 20 to 40 years longer. Tieflings' physical traits often reflect their ancestry, which can lie dormant for generations. Those with ties to diabolic or demonic origins may exhibit horns, tails, forked tongues, leathery or scaly skin, a scent of brimstone, or warm flesh. Some tales even mention them lacking shadows or reflections, and some may have goat-like legs or hooves. Tieflings descended from Rakshasa may have furred skin or feline eyes, while those from night hags could have small horns, red eyes, or blue skin. However, most tieflings typically display only one or two of such features. Some trace their lineage to powerful gods, each with distinct physical traits. For example, those sired by Bashaba may have antlers and white hair, while those sired by Mask may lack reflections. In Mulharand, tieflings are often descended from unions with Set or Sebek. In neighboring Thay, powerful wizards deliberately spawn tieflings as part of their schemes for power. In 1358, the Toral 13 Warlock Coven cursed many tiefling lineages with the blood of Asmodeus altering their lineage to that of the Archdevil himself. This was intended to elevate Asmodeus to a racial god. After Asmodeus ascended to godhood during the Spell Plague of 1385, most tieflings on Toril bear the Asmodean lineage and share a devilish appearance. Before Asmodeus' ascension, intermarriage could dilute infernal blood, but afterward, tiefling unions always result in tiefling offspring. In the late 15th century, tieflings of other lineages began to be born again, although those of the Asmodian lineage remain the most numerous. Tieflings possess several abilities bestowed upon them by their fiendish lineage. Generally, they are captivating and intelligent beings, emanating a seductive aura despite their inherently malevolent background. Tieflings excel in cunning compared to many other races, although this isn't their predominant trait. From an early age, most tieflings recognize their divergence from others often yielding to peculiar urges and inclinations due to their unique heritage. 
Raised with little of the affection typical of human children, many tieflings grow into embittered individuals, anticipating rejection from society. While some succumb to this path of darkness, others vehemently reject it, striving to positively impact their surroundings and sometimes emerge as the most heroic figures. Yet few can uphold this resolve entirely, with most tieflings occupying a middle ground between both extremes. Due to widespread distrust stemming from their fiendish heritage, tieflings often harbor a similar skepticism, relying on themselves for support. Their inherent pride and secretive nature, coupled with somber demeanor, contribute to their reputation as social outcasts and unreliable rogues. However, individuals of other races may find that once they extend friendship and trust to a tiefling, it is reciprocated wholeheartedly. Once such a bond is established, it is seldom broken. Tieflings exhibit power in combat, particularly as skilled warriors. They display agility and swiftness in melee engagements, favoring weapons that blend sharpness with speed. Hand crossbows, daggers, long swords, ronsors, scimitars, spears, and stilettos are among their commonly wielded armaments. With the tendency towards ambidexterity, most tieflings adopt a dual-wielding combat style, eschewing heavy armor and shields in favor of lighter protection. In terms of magical abilities, tieflings inclined towards the arcane often become warlocks. Those delving into arcane spellcasting feel drawn to the fiendish energies of the plains, leading tiefling wizards to specialize as diviners to glean knowledge from the lower plains or as conjurers to summon dark spirits akin to themselves. Endowed with an inherent resistance to heat and a trace of bloodlust enhancing their combat, tieflings possess a capability termed infernal wrath, channeling their innate rage and potential for evil to augment their attacks. Some tieflings go even further, unlocking additional fiendish potential, sometimes manifesting wings reminiscent of those borne by fiends. Additionally, certain tieflings possess the innate ability to cast darkness spells, although not all members of the race demonstrate this trait. Similar to other races resulting from the blending of multiple ancestries, tieflings lack a distinct culture to call their own. However, they exhibit many characteristic traits that are not necessarily innate, including their attitudes toward their lineage. While some tieflings embrace their heritage, others recoil from it, giving rise to the two most prevalent stereotypes among their kind. The former group, proud of their fiendish lineage, often harbor a fascination with darker and sinister occurrences in the world, yet they are not inherently evil or inclined to perpetuate such malevolence. Some among them utilize their knowledge of evil and their own fiendish abilities to thwart dark plots and schemes, while others seek to emulate nefarious deeds. Conversely, other tieflings feel ashamed or fearful of their ancestry and aspire to distance themselves from the shadow it casts over them. Some strive to counteract the evil associated with their lineage by perpetually performing acts of good, while others prefer to remain inconspicuous, evading notice and striving to be overlooked rather than targeted due to their past. Despite their diverse motivations, tieflings often harbor mutual distrust sometimes projecting onto each other the same biases opposed upon them by outsiders. Nevertheless, many secretly yearn for the companionship of fellow tieflings seeking a sense of kinship. Some form alliances as partners in crime, while others are sought out by virtuous tieflings hoping to redeem their brethren. In their interactions with other races, tieflings generally struggle to build rapport and are slow to trust individuals of any race, including their own. Their animosity towards others is most pronounced in their instinctive fear and loathing of Asimar, while Devas evoke similar reactions, hindering successful interactions between the two races. Among the most common races, tieflings feel the strongest affinity with half-orcs who share their experiences of being targets of revulsion and hatred. As the offspring of fiends and humans, tieflings lack a true homeland and are scattered throughout Toril. They were once common in Mulharand and Unther, although both nations were devastated by the spell plague. Tieflings also have a significant presence in Thay, where they are enslaved and used as pawns by Thay's Zulkirs in their political struggles. The rise of Zas Tom drove many tieflings out of Thay. In the 15th century, they were frequently found in Narfel and High Emaskar, with some welcome to Tamanthar due to the Dragonborn's policy of racial tolerance. Others align themselves with the Janasi servants of Memnon and Kalim Shan, or settled along the Sword Coast, especially in cosmopolitan cities like Baldur's Gate. In Aglarond, tieflings were tolerated with reluctance as enemies of Thay. Upon arriving at the depths of hell, 
Asmodeus either invented or spontaneously manifested the infernal language. His blood gave rise to many early devils, although the Batezu are generally believed to have originated from the plane itself, a notion not entirely inaccurate in later times. Asmodeus instituted the infernal bureaucracy and divided Beator among his loyal followers, establishing smaller realms and fiefdoms. The Batezu, both a singular and plural term, inhabit the Nine Hells, once being wicked mortals whose souls were damned to Beator as a result of their diabolical actions or infernal pacts. Deprived of their individuality through horrendous torture and remolded with the divine energy drawn from the corrupted collective, the Batezu established a culture of suffering, rising to dominance through the oppression of the damned. Their primary individual aim is to ascend the infernal hierarchy, driven by the desire to shape the multiverse. Those who adhere to the principles of lawful evil typically advance quicker than those who don't, valuing traits such as betrayal and deceit. One theory suggests that those Batezu who excel in these pursuits often endure significant suffering themselves, having lacked these qualities at some point. Lower-ranking Batezu tend to form friendships, but as they climb the ranks, these bonds diminish, with higher-ranking Batezu subtly encouraging betrayal among their mentees, thereby instilling the value of self-reliance. They undergo physical and psychological transformations upon promotion or demotion. While some believe they lose their memories with each change, they usually retain their minds. Advancement typically correlates with heightened intelligence and the ability to access centuries worth of memories associated with each stage of their existence. Frequently, they find themselves overwhelmed by the sheer volume of their memories, making it challenging to recall significant details without considerable time. Exploiting this tendency, one could strategically act during the interval it takes for Batezu to recollect such trivialities, effectively catching them off guard. Nevertheless, they are universally vengeful beings, necessitating constant vigilance for anyone who crosses their path. Despite their alignment with lawful evil, lower-ranking Batezu still harbor traces of chaos within them, occasionally leading to acts of disobedience. The instinctual response of these savage devils, including the mindless Lemurs and Nipuribos, as well as the sentient Abishai, is to resort to aggression without hesitation or inquiry. Psychologically outmaneuvering Batezu, especially those of high rank, is challenging. However, one strategy to gain an advantage, or at least sow confusion among these lawful beings, is to act upon seemingly chaotic impulses. Nonetheless, these instinctual behaviors are not truly random, and the intelligent Batezu can discern the underlying patterns, rendering this tactic only effective against less intelligent and lower-ranking devils. Another potential approach, albeit difficult, is to undermine a Batezu's belief system by convincing them of the fallacy of their ways. However, this tactic is fraught with challenges since Batezu are deeply indoctrinated, and any attempt at manipulation would need to be executed with utmost care, as they are unlikely to be fooled twice by the same deception, regardless of the source. At times, Batezu rebel against the hierarchy of hell, embracing alternative lifestyles. These renegades are not only despised by their fellows, but actively hunted down to be killed. Among these rebels are a subgroup known as the Risen, contrasting with the fallen angels by adopting more virtuous principles aligned with good. Given the difficulty in distinguishing between a genuine Risen Batezu and an imposter posing as one, these already scarce creatures typically avoid each other. Batezu possess complete immunity to fire and poison, along with a considerable resilience against acid, low temperature, and gases. While silver weaponry can pose a threat to them, it's less effective compared to holy weapons or electricity. Holy water is also efficacious against Batezu. Occasionally, they exhibit regenerative abilities, a challenge that demons commonly address by consuming them. Attempting to probe a Batezu's thoughts with spells like Detect Thoughts is perilous, as their minds operate in ways beyond mortal comprehension. Such attempts often result in madness, or a state akin to that induced by a feeble mind spell with long-lasting consequences. They typically possess a range of innate spells and spell-like abilities, inherent and accessible without any formal training. These abilities are so deeply ingrained that their utilization requires minimal mental effort, akin to a human using their limbs. 
Teleportation is a common ability among them, allowing them to disengage from combat and reposition advantageously, a tactic they frequently employ. Moreover, Batezu can summon kin for assistance, swiftly tipping the scales in their favor during confrontations, transforming evenly matched battles into overwhelming onslaughts due to the sudden numerical superiority. Typically, a Batezu's existence commences as the soul of a deceased lawful evil mortal on Beator. From a pool of roughly a hundred thousand souls, only about a dozen are selected as the most promising and transformed into Lemurs. Additionally, Batezu acquire extra souls from night hags, basing their selection on the larva's ability to survive independently. Despite its seemingly arbitrary nature, this process is deliberately orchestrated. Neglecting a soul leads it to evolve into a Nuparibo, a natural progression. Nuparibos are swollen devils, standing approximately the size of a human, but much heavier bodies, waddling as they move about. Resembling Lemurs, they are vaguely humanoid creatures with barely discernible features, sporting elongated, arm-like limbs and heads with eyes and mouths sewn shut, though this doesn't hinder their ability to emit shrieks or sense their surroundings. Traces of their former selves persist, manifesting as tattoos, scars, unusual skin tones, or other remnants. Swarms of pests envelop their distended forms, delivering stinging sensations. These creatures possess minimal personalities, lacking the ingenuity for independent combat strategies, even when directed. They exhibit obedience to their superiors and derive pleasure from tormenting enemies. Their telepathic susceptibility drives them to follow any devil's orders, hoping to alleviate their own suffering. Their existence revolves around insatiable hunger, devouring anything within reach. They boast formidable resilience, slowly regenerating even from complete destruction unless specific conditions are met. They can only be permanently vanquished outside the lower planes or by wounds inflicted by holy implements. Their mindlessness renders them immune to mental manipulation. Their grotesque appearance and deteriorated mental state evoke a profound terror. When congregated in groups of ten or more, they emit an aura akin to causing fear in their adversaries. Surrounding them are swarms of vermin that sting non-devils nearby. Within the Nine Hells, the Baribos relentlessly pursue any creature harmed by the vermin. Beyond their innate drive to inflict suffering and satisfy their insatiable hunger, Nuparibos exhibit limited independent cognition. They aggressively attack any non-devil they encounter and persistently pursue potential prey unless diverted by another source of sustenance. While individually feeble, they typically gather in groups, obstructing vital passages or launching assaults in coordinated mobs. Lacking personal objectives or survival instincts, they dutifully heed the telepathic directives of devilish overlords, rendering them effective troops in the blood war. Deployed in groups of four to eight, their numbers swell into the thousands on the battlefield. Supervised by the Ocelluth Devils, they are armed with rudimentary weapons as their combat efficiency remains unchanged with more sophisticated gear. Often led by Spinagons, they engage demonic forces without strategy or foresight, unless specifically instructed to employ their fear-inducing capabilities against a single target. Otherwise, they charge into combat mindlessly wielding their weapons or resorting to biting and clawing. In the infernal military hierarchy, Nipper Boys serve as expendable assets, fulfilling roles such as distractions, rear guards, or cannon fodder to absorb enemy attacks. They are never pivotal in military campaigns, merely diverting enemy resources away from more significant targets. Without further instructions, the hordes aimlessly roam the Nine Hells, attacking any non-devil entities they encounter. They occupy the lowest echelon in the Betezu hierarchy, surpassing Lemurs only nominally in certain respects. Promotion from the status of a Nuparibo is non-existent, with demotion to Lemur being the sole pathway for further advancement. Subjected to mistreatment by higher-ranking devils, Nuparibos serve as the labor force and sustenance source within Beator, replenishing their ranks through incessant devilish power struggles. Swarming Avernus and Dis by the hundreds of thousands, they are akin to vermin infesting the Nine Hells, often lost amidst the chaos of battle. Any valuable items scavenged by Nuparibos are typically confiscated upon their return, or they may be relegated to guarding their handler's possessions. 
Encountering a lone Nipiribo usually signifies a survivor of a disbanded mob or a servant gifted to a lowly mortal by a devil, a notion amusing to many devils who find the idea of diminished beings serving mortals humorous. Additionally, they are frequently utilized as bargaining chips in Batesi negotiations with Yugoloths, often suffering neglect, abuse, or consumption by denizens of the lower plains. The motion to a Nipiribo occurs following significant failures by a devil, viewed as a stark demonstration of incompetence. Occasionally, a demoted devil retains some value in their original form, prompting their superior to keep them around for potential future use or to orchestrate schemes involving their restoration to former status. Rumors circulate regarding Asmodeus's purported amusement derived from such intrigue, suggesting he may even gift former court members in Nuparibo form to mortal followers as a form of entertainment. Should a higher-ranking devil inadvertently descend to the status of Nuparibo, they typically provide their subordinates with instructions for locating them, along with detailed guidelines for restoring their former position. However, this arrangement is fraught with challenges. Distinguishing a single Nipiribo from a swarm proves challenging even to their fellow devils, and occasionally, disobedience to such orders occurs intentionally. Some devils toil for centuries before reclaiming their former rank, enduring the same horrific treatments required to regain their original forms. Despite the uncertainty, many devils perceive the opportunity to ascend from the lower echelons as preferable to the inevitability of death. Ecologically, it was rumored that Nipiribos never consume food, despite their insatiable hunger. In reality, they perpetually seek to satiate their ravenous appetites by consuming anything available, yet their gluttony forever remains unfulfilled. Devoid of sight, hearing, and speech, they rely solely on scent to perceive nearby creatures contributing to their diminished intelligence. Introducing an overpowering odor is one method to impair a Nuparibo's senses. The process to transform a devil into a Nuparibo is grueling, typically administered by an excruciarch, resulting in a complete obliteration of their former identity. This transformation involves the removal of flesh and other horrific acts to transform their bodies. Despite these drastic alterations, Unique scars serve as identifiers of their previous selves, prompting most higher-ranking devils to maintain recognizable features. If a devil perishes beyond Beator without deliberate departure, rebirth as a Nipiribo is the common outcome, necessitating a climb back up the infernal hierarchy unaided. A Nipiribo's demise outside Beator is permanent, while those within typically return as Nipiribos with a rare chance of transformation into Lemurs. Alternatively, they can arise from soul larvae left unattended on Beator, though most eventually transition into Lemurs to fully integrate into infernal society. Souls of the morally ambiguous, who perpetuate evil through apathy or laziness rather than active malevolence, often manifest as Nipiribos upon arrival into the Nine Hells. Genderless and incapable of reproduction, they undergo a profound transformation after countless centuries of existence evolving into a new, enigmatic form through natural progression rather than promotion via torment. As maturation progresses, subtle yet profound changes occur. They gain sight and limited sapience, able to communicate in an unknown language and comprehend their circumstances, albeit with limited intellect. Eventually, their transformation accelerates dramatically, culminating in the eruption of dozens of pink tendrils from their pale stomachs. These evolved beings, twice as swift and resilient as regular Nipiribos, possess immunity to typical devil weaknesses such as electricity and can temporarily drain the life force of anything they touch. Nipiribos are categorized among the Batezu, with the Batezu asserting their inclusion within their ranks. However, in reality, Nipiribos, and by extension, their potential evolutionary forms, have inhabited Beator far longer than the Batezu. The ancient inhabitants of Beator, known as the Beatorians, no longer occupy the plain, although the cause of their vanishing is unknown. As the original denizens, Nipiribos naturally emerge from the undisturbed larvae and are anticipated to mature into specimens of their own race over time. The Batesi perpetuate the falsehood that Nipiribos are part of their race to facilitate their transformation into Lemurs and prevent the resurgence of the ancient inhabitants. 
This deception is maintained to conceal the true nature of the Nipuribos and safeguard against the emergence of new members of the old race, known only to the Archdevils and perhaps members of the Dark Eight. The revelation that the Nipuribos are not Batezu was disclosed by the Yugoloths at some point during the 14th century to Toral. Lemurs are repulsive creatures, resembling blobs of molten, putrid flesh that sluggishly ooze across the ground as they move. Below their waists, they are formless, shuddering masses, weighing approximately a hundred pounds, while their heads and torsos possess a vaguely humanoid shape. Despite their constantly shifting and melting facial features, they maintain a permanent expression of horror and anguish, with most incessantly muttering to themselves even though they lack the ability to sleep. Occasionally, traces of a Lemur's former self can be discerned when they are not too contorted by torment. While most are unrecognizable, a rare few may exhibit faint memories of their mortal lives through sporadic facial expressions or nervous twitches. Some Lemurs may even retain remnants of their past lives, such as small shreds of clothing clinging to their amorphous form. However, over time, any remnants of individuality gradually fade as they endure their wretched existence. Lemurs are nearly devoid of consciousness, effectively incapable of making decisions, even those concerning themselves. They exist in a perpetual state of agony and harbor a deep-seated resentment towards the cosmos, blaming reality itself for their plight and violently lashing out at all beings. Only the telepathic directives of their superiors can temporarily restrain their thirst for vengeance, as Lemurs are highly responsive to such commands and obediently follow the strongest devil in their vicinity. They typically avoid interactions with other devils and roam in rampaging hordes. Lemurs possess a challenging resilience, with a slow but inherent regeneration ability that makes them difficult to kill. Even if reduced to ash, they can fully regenerate over time. Permanently eradicating them typically requires the use of holy implements, such as a holy weapon or holy water. Alternatively, consuming them is an effective method, which demons commonly employ due to its reliability. In combat, Lemurs advance in infernal legions under the telepathic command of their masters, mindlessly slaughtering everything in their path until directed otherwise. They typically attack by clawing or beating their prey into submission, relying on sheer numbers rather than tactics. These numbers can swell to over a thousand under a single devil commander, allowing them to march in a specialized wedge formation known as a battle drive, which enhances their accuracy. While their overwhelming numbers often lead to eventual victory, they commonly suffer high casualty rates, making this tactic reserved for desperate battles where success outweighs the needs for longevity. Lemurs occupy the lowest rung of the Batezu hierarchy, enduring disdain from other devils, regular abuse, and lacking individual names. They are assigned menial tasks within infernal groups and are marshaled in large numbers by the Spinagons and Omnizus to bolster the infernal armies deployed in the Blood War. Acting as cannon fodder, they draw enemy fire in initial confrontations. When not fighting in battle, Lemurs are often left in the fiery spawning pits of hell to torment any mortal souls unfortunate enough to be caught in the hellfire. Suspected to be virtually limitless in number, they frequently roam Avernus and Dis in massive hordes. The mindlessness of Lemurs is presumed to be deliberate, allowing the Batezu to easily manipulate the lower caste into embracing the path of evil. Due to this lack of consciousness, Lemurs do not have a specific lesson they need to learn in order to earn promotion. Patrolling Amnizus instill the many rules of Beator into the minds of Lemurs, who arrive in the Nine Hells driven solely by their inclination toward evil. Despite their lowly status, Lemurs have the potential to ascend to high positions in the infernal hierarchy. Any Lemur theoretically has the opportunity to rise to the ranks to become a pit fiend and ascend further to higher nobility. Upon becoming a Lemur, the Batezi recognize the creature as part of their race rather than as a petitioner although they remain beneath their notice. They have yet to undergo the process of having their spirits cleansed of the taint of chaos and possibly even goodness. The promotion process for Lemures is largely arbitrary, driven by the needs of the promoter rather than the merit of the Lemure, though sometimes it is done for entertainment. 
while Lemur has the chance to be promoted to a spinagon, it may be required to compete against other Lemures for the position. After emerging victorious, its skin is removed to reveal the form of a spinagon. Alternatively, the devil overseeing the fight may opt to kill the winner if the contest fails to provide sufficient entertainment. Promotion at such a low level can be initiated by a greater devil when there is demand for a specialized skill, such as transforming into an imp or unexpectedly into a wraith or specter. Conversely, it is also possible for a higher ranking Batezu to commit such a grave offense that they are demoted to Lemire status, resulting in the loss of all their memories. Typically, only the most depraved mortal souls have the potential to attain Lemur status. Upon arrival in Beator, these souls are dispatched to torture stations, where they undergo a process of excruciating agony, draining their energy, fueling them with fury, and depleting them of all vitality. This process often involves the use of a bed-like torture apparatus called a Shriver, which extracts energy from mortal souls, as well as the efforts of Chitin and Excruciar teams to transform petitioner victims into proto lemures Once completely drained, the souls undergo arcane rituals that imbue them with infernal power. Their creation is finalized by dropping the proto lemure into the maggot pit in Avernus, where the drained husk swiftly perishes before being reborn as a lemure. They can also be created from soul larvae, though out of approximately 100,000 larvae, only about a dozen are transformed into lemures by devils through a natural selection process. On rare occasions, lemures may spontaneously manifest from Beator itself, although such occurrences are infrequent. Souls without prior contracts with devils who find themselves in the Nine Hells through their own lawful evil actions often emerge from the river Styx. If a lemure fails to secure a promotion, which is largely a matter of chance given their lowly status, it gradually dissipates into Beator. As Batezu rise in the ranks, they are categorized into three tiers, least, lesser, and greater. Promotion occurs when a Batezu grasps the fundamental lesson that their current form embodies regarding the essence of lawful evil, with Lemurs and Nuperibos being exceptions. Promotion can occur through two avenues, chance promotion, exclusive to Lemurs, and intentional promotion, which involves a bureaucratic procedure. Batezu maintain ministries responsible for meticulously monitoring each individual Batezu, maintaining comprehensive records to ensure accurate promotion decisions. On an individual level, Batezu aspire to attain positions of authority where they are not subject to manipulation, a driving force for lower ranking Batezu. At a broader level, they seek to enhance the collective welfare of their race a goal pursued by higher-ranking Batezu. Such endeavors are motivated by the imperative of survival, evident in their participation in conflicts like the Blood War, where competent leadership is crucial for the numerically inferior devils to stand their ground. The Ministry of Promotion assesses candidates based on two main criteria, tenure and performance. Batezu are required to serve a minimum duration in a specific role, which can be extended based on their performance. In Batezu culture, a good performance is not necessarily defined by exceptional displays of skill, but rather by the absence of errors, even if this meant the actual results of a good performance were only mediocre. Lower-ranking Batezu who demonstrated mastery over the violent tendencies often found themselves at the forefront of consideration for promotion. Attempting to influence the promotion process through bribery or manipulation of records is punishable for both the manipulating official and the Batezu seeking promotion. Despite the risks, such practices are not unheard of, and the potential for punishment serves as an incentive for subtlety and proficiency in clandestine activities. The method of promotion for Batezu involved undergoing torture, with each form of Batezu subjected to a distinct form of torment to achieve advancement. Nonetheless, certain commonalities exist among these methods. The torture procedures are immediate, with multiple Batezu collaborating to modify or torture the body of the promoted individual into its new form, invariably that of a fully matured adult of the respective species. Batezu society operates on a strict meritocratic principle. An individual's capabilities and readiness to assume leadership roles are the primary determinants of success, ensuring a society where merit and ambition hold paramount importance. In Batezu society, demotion carries significant weight. Individuals face the motion as a consequence of poor performance or transgressions. 
the degree of demotion for a particular offender is determined by the severity and frequency of their infractions, potentially resulting in demotion to the status of a lemur. Demotion poses inherent dangers for the individual being demoted, particularly if they find themselves among their former subordinates. Given the vindictive nature of Batezu, there's a likelihood that they may seek retribution against their former superior for past grievances, potentially resorting to lethal means. To avoid such retribution, some of them opt to rebel and go rogue. The pit of flame is the most dreaded punishment among Batezu, instilling fear in those who face the prospect of being cast into its fiery depths. Military service in their society is demanding and regimented, devoid of any assurance of safety or preferential treatment based on rank. Despite this, military rank carries no additional prestige compared to civilian positions. A Batezu standing within the military hierarchy holds equal regard to their civilian counterpart of the same rank and form. While military service is rigorous, it offers opportunities for rapid promotion and a realistic chance, albeit slim, of ascending to the Batezu nobility for veterans. Conversely, civilians must possess truly exceptional track records to even be considered for entry into the nobility. They typically don't independently acquire magic knowledge like wizards. Their understanding of arcane magic stems from their mortal origins rather than being innate to their nature. Few Batezu are willing to dedicate themselves to learning magic in addition to their inherent abilities. However, when they do pursue wizardry, it is noted that Batezu who delve into such studies face a hard limit to their potential. Only pit fiends have the potential to infinitely strengthen as wizards in theory, as their potential knows no ceiling. Nevertheless, learning magic beyond a certain point could, though not always, necessitate foregoing physical training, potentially rendering them weaker than their non-wizard counterparts. There are four categories of Batezu wizards, normal, distorted, unenlightened, and augmented. Normal possessed additional learned magic. Distorted lost their innate resistance to magic due to their focus on learned spellcasting. Unenlightened Batezu utilized learned magic at the expense of innate abilities, while augmented ones demonstrate exceptional proficiency, maintaining their innate abilities while gaining versatility through learned magic. Religious practices among Batezu are rare, often revolving around pacts with deities to gain power rather than genuine piety. Any religious affiliations are typically as specialty priests of lawful evil deities. However, being a priest is frowned upon in Batezu society, and as Batezu rise in hierarchy, they are expected to sever ties with their deity. Consequently, no Batezu above the status of Kornagon holds the title of priest. The governance of Batezu society is divided in between two groups, the Noble Batezu and the Dark Eight. The Dark Eight oversee day-to-day -day affairs, education, and matters pertaining to the blood war through various ministries. In contrast, matters concerning the governance of the entire plane of Beator and its individual layers falls under the jurisdiction of the nobles. Batezu institutions are present in every city with emergency protocols in place in the event of the ministry being destroyed by demonic forces. Batezu despise resting, viewing it as a hindrance to their relentless pursuit of advancement. Consequently, they strive to minimize their downtime. As noted earlier, high-ranking Batezu can delay their need for rest, sometimes for literal centuries, at the expense of requiring extended periods of rest when they can no longer suppress their fatigue. These prolonged periods of rest leave Batezu exceptionally vulnerable, prompting them to maintain secret resting places that are not only concealed, but also heavily fortified, with the level of protection increasing in accordance with the Batezu station. A common belief holds that Batezu cannot freely depart from Beator to reach the Prime Material Plane or any of the Upper Planes. This restriction stems from high-ranking Batezu forging contracts that bind them to certain areas and prohibit their entry into others. The vast majority of Batezu adhere to these pacts, refraining from trespassing into forbidden territories. Notably exempt from these contracts are the Aranyes, granting them unrestricted freedom of movement. Batezu who violate the contractual obligations typically fall into several categories. Those who believe they can overthrow their superiors responsible for their punishment. Those confident that their actions will yield significant results that outweigh the transgressions and individuals with chaotic or good alignments that simply lack foresight. Batezu can be summoned from Beator through two methods. Firstly, a specific Batezu can be summoned by incorporating its name into the summoning spell. 
creating a poll for the name Batesu to answer the summoner's call. However, Batesu disliked this method as it interrupts their duties, making them liable for punishment or disrupts their schemes, which is considered a grave insult in their society. A second method involves casting a summoning spell without specifying a particular Batesu, resulting in the creation of a spell crystal in Beator. These crystals are located at predetermined spots known by the Minister of Mortal Relations. Batesu are dispatched to these locations to be summoned, given tasks upon arrival. While they are provided with agendas, they have autonomy in executing them. Batesu summoned in this matter are regarded as the public face of Beator, meaning any actions that tarnish Beator's reputation will result in punishment through torture. As a general principle, Batesu do not inherently value mortals, viewing them merely as tools to be exploited for their own ends. However, they recognize a certain degree of value in mortals possessing magical abilities. Physically restraining a summon Batesu from engaging in violent behavior is achievable through the proper implementation of a magic circle. However, safeguarding against their manipulation proves challenging. They constantly seek to advance their race's agenda, and when summoned, they typically attempt to negotiate terms to further their cause. In such negotiations, Batesu often exploit any loopholes present. If summoned repeatedly, a Batesu may refrain from exploiting minor loopholes, instead accumulating small, multiple advantages over time and eventually leveraging them against their summoners. Mortals seeking protection from such negotiations may opt for straightforward demands rather than engaging in complex bargaining. However, when faced with circumstances where they cannot advance their cause, Batesu strictly adhere to orders, albeit in frustratingly meticulous ways. They do not worship deities in the manner typical of mortals, and most often, they do not worship them at all. Their reverence is usually directed at entities such as the Dark Eight, the Noble Batezu, and the Lord of the Nine. The rare instances where Batezu do engage with deities are solely for the purpose of gaining power, rather than out of genuine piety. They usually take measures to conceal any relationships they have with the gods. Their economy operates differently from the mortal one. The most prized currency among the Batezu is not money. While money may be employed to entice mortals into committing evil acts, it is not the primary measure by which they earn respect from their peers. Instead, Batezu value commodities such as souls, magic, knowledge, and favors. Shops on Beator primarily serve travelers, with Batezu's supply and demand being managed as follows. Lower-ranking Batesi receive what they need from their higher-ranking counterparts, while the latter take what they desire from the former. Batesi architecture serves as a visual indicator of their status. It features spikes, protrusions, and blades as prominent design elements. The layout of Batesi cities follows a fairly uniform pattern, with buildings of greater importance situated closer to the city center, while less significant structures are positioned near the periphery. While they are not renowned for their artistic abilities, it does not imply a lack of aesthetic understanding or creative inspiration. However, their inclination towards forming patterns often detracts from the originality of their artwork. For instance, a piece of music composed by Batezu may begin as a work of inspiration, but the need to adhere to a predetermined pattern renders the resulting composition predictable, provided the listener can discern the underlying structure. Few lower-ranking Batezu are permitted to engage in artistic pursuits. They are proficient in numerous languages and possess telepathic communication abilities. When communicating amongst themselves, they utilize a highly complex language specific to their hierarchical station. Each station within the hierarchy has its own dialect, with the complexity and ability to convey abstract concepts increasing with higher stations. Batezu typically understand the language of their own station and those of lower-ranking stations, with knowledge of higher-ranking languages considered a punishable offense. Examining a Batezu's anatomy reveals that their bodies contain internal organs, positioned similarly to those found in humans. However, there are notable differences. For instance, they possess highly developed pineal glands that enhance their sensitivity to planar matters, oversized adrenal glands that contribute to increased combat ability and aggression, and scaled internal organs that enhance resilience against physical blows. The coloration of their blood varies depending on their environment, with black being its default hue. One aspect of their anatomy that remains a mystery is their slightly metallic bones, leading observers to speculate that their bodies may be crafted rather than grown. 
Only male Batesu are fertile, leading to Batesu offspring being produced with female members of other races. Generally, they are zealous about leaving a lasting legacy through progeny. They do not require sustenance for survival, but nonetheless indulge in eating and drinking as a pastime rather than out of necessity. In terms of their dietary preferences, they favor meat from sentient creatures, with a preference for meat from good aligned sentient beings or those inherently good by nature, such as devas or solars. Consuming meat allows Batezu to absorb the life force of the consumed creature. Batezu seldom consume souls while the owner is alive. Instead, they may consume souls after the owner's death, particularly when the soul manifests in a physical form like a larva. Batezu view souls as potential resources that could be corrupted and consider consuming them before the owner's death to be wasteful. When they drink, they often do so from the rivers and lakes of Beator, which contain fluids unsuitable for mortals. They do require a period of rest, if not for sleep, then at least to recuperate. Generally, lower-ranking Batezu necessitate more frequent but shorter rest periods, whereas the higher-ranking ones require less frequent but longer periods of rest. During these rest periods, they engage in dreaming, which serves the specific purpose of motivating them for their subsequent active cycle. An intriguing aspect of their dreaming is their ability to share these dreams with others. They can offer up their individual dreams to the collective and take individual dreams from the pool. This process instills a sense of order among dreaming Batezu. Drawing a collective dream results in a mental transformation for the dreaming Batezu due to its influence, while someone using their dream allows them to influence others. There are several types of Batezu which are engineered in the Nine Hells. Assassin Batezu were developed in response to significant casualties caused by demonic, particularly Cambian assassins. They aim to inflict similar havoc upon their enemies. Assassin Batezu can be of lesser or greater rank, but are still regarded as part of the elite. They are enticed with the promise of an additional promotion for exemplary performance as assassins, an offer most Batezu find irresistible. Assassin types gain the ability to turn invisible and to employ mundane stealth techniques, albeit at the expense of sacrificing one ability characteristic of their current rank. Typically, they possess a slender physique compared to standard specimens of their species. Blind fiends were among the experimental modifications considered failures. The objective was to create fiends capable of consistently casting magic missile. However, the outcome produced fiends who could only unleash magic missile from their eyes while keeping them open, requiring them to be blindfolded outside of combat. Moreover, even when their eyes were open, they lacked sight. They relied on guides to direct their attacks, often targeting their own forces to settle personal vendettas. Regarded as a failure, the project to promote fiends to blind fiends was terminated. Illusionists are fiends proficient in creating potent illusions capable of inflicting physical harm, albeit at the cost of their own life force. They can do so only a limited number of times, and upon depletion, they perish with no chance of further promotion. Those in authority over such fiends were cautioned to remain physically evasive to avoid retaliation from illusionists. Physically, these fiends appear frail and are often afflicted with sickness. Batezu assert two beliefs regarding their mortality. First, they claim that aside from violent demises, they are essentially immortal. Second, in the event of death, they profess to be reincarnated back on Beator. The former assertion is widely accepted as truth. However, the latter is not entirely accurate. If a Batezu perishes on Beator, it remains deceased. Conversely, if it died elsewhere, the outcome depended on whether it had voluntarily ventured beyond Beator. For instance, if a Batezu finds itself outside Beator due to a superior's directive, it was considered there by its own volition, and if slain, it remains dead. On the other hand, if summoned by another entity, such as another Batezu, its demise resulted in a reincarnation as a Nuparibo on Beator. Batezus harbor a deep fear of true death due to their uncertainty about its implications. While deceased mortals are believed to experience some form of afterlife, the fate awaiting a deceased Batezu, if anything, remains obscure, evoking profound dread for them. During Asmodeus's reign, following his complete descent and consolidation of power in Hell, he initiated numerous plans and schemes aimed at achieving authority across reality. His actions, both confirmed and rumored, were dark and far-reaching, altering entire worlds and the multiverse itself, 
establishing a precise timeline for these events proves nearly impossible, although they all occurred before the infamous coup that failed to seize his throne. He claimed Ben Sozia as his concubine, partly as a trophy, and either fathered or adopted his daughter Glacia. Ben Sozia resembles a humanoid she-devil with lengthy white hair and striking black eyes. Her scarlet skin, brown hooves for feet, and forked tail complete her devilish visage. Adorned in flowing black robes, accented with scarlet silk, and a golden diadem encrusted with rubies, she exudes an air of regal power. Devoted entirely to her lord Asmodeus, Bensosia exudes contentment in her role, her demeanor marked by an aloof and courteously icy manner. As the queen of the Nine Hells, Bensosia reigns supreme among the archdevil consorts, wielding a formidable array of abilities. She possesses innate mastery over pyrotechnics, flame manipulation, necromancy, and various spells such as fireball, lightning bolt, and dispel magic. Additionally, her repertoire includes charm, telepathy, detection spells, and teleportation. Twice daily, she wields the deadly finger of death. Bensosia's history intertwines with Asmodeus as his consort and the mother of Glacia. However, her fate takes a dark turn when the archfiend Levistus intrudes upon her life. Accounts differ on the nature of their encounter, but they converge on one tragic event, Levistus' fatal assault on Bensosia, leading to his imprisonment and forever altering the Nine Hells. During this initial period, Asmodeus significantly reshaped the plane, rendering the Nine Hells markedly different from their previous state and in some aspects unrecognizable compared to their modern incarnation. For instance, Avernus was originally crafted by Asmodeus as a breathtakingly beautiful paradise, enticing mortals with endless delights to ensnare them. Stygia was suspected, though never confirmed, to have once been a material plane world before its inhabitants pledged their souls and home to Asmodeus for a sanctuary from Cataclysm, ultimately transforming it into another layer of hell. While Asmodeus maintains his supremacy in infernal politics, the landscape is not static. One of the earliest lords to challenge his rule was Levistus, who was subsequently overthrown and replaced by Geryon. Initially resentful of his new position, Geryon eventually embraced it, leading to a perpetual power struggle between the two over the control of Stygia, until Levistus' reign ended abruptly following his grievous offense against Asmodeus. In combat, devils prioritized tactics aimed at neutralizing enemies' abilities for prolonged periods. This includes targeting and eliminating animal companions and similar support creatures to undermine their opponent's strength. When engaging living adversaries, devils adopt the strategy of ensuring secure kills, dispatching unconscious foes to prevent their return to the fight through magical healing. On the prime material plane, where death does not permanently kill them but may affect their rank, devils are strategic in their approach. They gauge battle conditions quickly and commit fully to engagements utilizing summoning abilities early to position allies advantageously. They may also employ noisy tactics to attract allies and deplete enemy resources by sending them expendable underlings to engage opponents. These decisions are based on assessments of the enemy's strength and the importance of the devil's own forces. Devils exhibit immunity to fire, a trait exploited in combat against demons. A prevalent tactic involves saturating a battlefield with fire, enabling devils to navigate it unharmed. This strategy, executed through innate abilities or learned magical skill, creates an environment where they can maneuver effectively. In confrontations with angels or archons, devils capable of flight assume leadership roles. A common tactic involves deploying special tanglefoot bags to ground celestial beings, facilitating attacks from earthbound devils. Similar to anti-demon tactics, devils utilize fire against angels and archons a highly effective method against these benevolent outsiders. Regardless of rank, devils serve as meticulous record keepers, documenting their achievements that demonstrate competence to superiors. Even when operating on the prime material plane, devils take measures to safeguard these records from rival factions. Methods include destruction to prevent leaks, with devils fiercely defending or retrieving records when necessary. In the event of invasion, preserving records takes precedence often leading to their destruction to prevent enemy acquisition. For devils, material wealth holds little value unless it serves their objectives, and they are willing to sacrifice it to avoid trouble. However, devils devoted to Mammon 
deviate from this norm, valuing material wealth and defending it at all costs. In battle, devils are focused on efficiently achieving their objectives, such as eliminating enemies without diverting attention elsewhere. This mindset is reflected in the layout of their layers, designed to capitalize on their strengths while neutralizing their opponents. Each species may arrange its layer differently. An Aranyase might optimize for aerial range combat, while a Hamatula will create a confined space to maximize the impact of its fireball ability. In addition to spatial adjustments, devils may exploit their immunities by introducing conditions or selecting locations that impose detrimental effects on intruders. For instance, a poison-immune devil might choose a naturally poisonous locale. Hematulas are slender humanoid creatures, slightly taller than humans. Their bodies are entirely covered in barbs. They have horned heads with long claws, and their burly tails are adorned with spines. Their eyes, shining and vigilant, move constantly across a room, making them appear anxious. These creatures exhibit extreme greed, constantly seeking to possess objects or beings. They take great pride in their duties, diligently attending to them to elevate their own status. Their agitated appearance and nervous tics reflect their inherent paranoia and suspicion. Though they prefer solitude, Hamatulas enjoy facing opponents to demonstrate their worth. Unlike some devils from higher circles of hell, they remain steadfast in pursuing criminals and are immune to bribery, negotiation, or pleas for mercy. In combat, barbed devils utilize their spikes for various purposes, including piercing opponents with their claws and tails, injuring those who come too close, and impaling enemies by embracing them. Their claw attacks instill supernatural fears in their foes upon the first strike. They possess the ability to manipulate flames and create fiery effects, such as producing and hurling flames with precision. They can also summon other Hamatulas or seek aid from Abishai or Barbazus through their gating abilities. While always ready for combat, Barb devils disdain conventional weapons, preferring to rely on their natural ornaments to impale foes. Those who manage to evade their close-range assaults may find themselves immobilized by spells like Hold Person, while distant adversaries face barrages of fire hurled their way. Depending on their mission's objectives, they may either engage in direct skirmishes or drive their enemies to retreat, pursuing them with claws and flames. In society, Loyalty and service are highly rewarded among barbed devils. They serve as the elite guardians of the middle layers of Beator, tasked with defending infernal strongholds, vaults, and prominent devils, such as pit fiends. Their patrols often traverse Mineros and Phlegethos, intercepting unauthorized travelers who breach the depths beyond Avernus and Dis, and monitoring the labyrinthine tunnels of the cities of the Nine Hells. Barbed devils are inherently solitary beings, only banding together when compelled by a superior Batezu, typically for investigative purposes in response to reports of intrusion. Unlike other devils, they lack the freedom to freely traverse between different layers of hell. Some speculate this limitation is physical, but in reality, barbed devils are intentionally tasked with patrolling specific layers to prevent them from straying too far from their guard duties. When called upon to the mortal realms, Hematulas prove valuable assets as bodyguards, champions, and in other roles requiring considerable power. Some of their kind dabble in magic, with a few honing their skills enough to cast spells like Fireball or Flame Arrow, although they generally lack proficiency as wizards. Alongside Ocelus, they form the majority of infernal priests. Advancement in the hierarchy of devils is often marked by painful transitions. Many Ocelus aspire to become Hamatulas with only the most skilled bypassing this stage. The quickest route to advancement for a Hamatula lies in demonstrating unwavering loyalty to its superiors. In terms of ecology, they possess glands behind their ears that produce a hallucinogenic substance, while commonly utilized by greater devils for torture and interrogation. Rumors suggest that large quantities of this secretion could yield potent potions of illusion. Ocelus are towering creatures measuring double the height of a normal human. Their dry, sickly skin appears tightly stretched over their skeletal frames, giving them a ghastly appearance, despite their heavy weight. Their tails resemble those of giant scorpions, while their heads resemble menacing skulls, emitting a putrid stench of decay. In terms of personality, they are malicious sadists who derive pleasure from the suffering of lesser beings. They exhibit patient vigilance and cunning, 
driven primarily by a spectrum of negative emotions such as lust, jealousy, hatred, and fury towards other creatures. While they delight in the torment of defiant inferiors, they harbor bitterness towards their own superiors for their elevated status. They are expected to adhere strictly to the tenets of Batesian morality and obey the will of their masters, with most displaying fanatical loyalty or at least outward obedience. They actively encourage other Batesu to demonstrate similar levels of viciousness and zeal. In terms of their abilities, they can emit an aura of fear, causing foes to flee in panic. They possess innate magical abilities, including flight, invisibility, and the creation of powerful illusions, as well as the ability to summon various creatures, such as Nuparibos, Lemurs, Spinagons, and others of their kind. Driven by relentless fury, they engage in combat with ferocious attacks using their teeth and claws, instilling terror in their foes to hinder any attempt at retaliation. While they are proficient in unarmed combat, they often wield bone-crafted hook pole arms to ensnare and injure their adversaries. Once their opponents are restrained and their will broken, they can further incapacitate them with venom from their tails. They typically focus on individual foes and use their wall of ice to divide up groups. In society, they function akin to a morality police within Beator, tasked with eradicating the erosion of infernal virtues. They closely monitor the activities of other devils, diligently reporting any transgressions and ensuring obedience. Taking their role as taskmasters seriously, they employ brutal disciplinary measures and severe motivational tactics to inspire adherence to the ideals of lawful evil in the Nine Hells. Primarily found in the lower circles, particularly Stygia, they also serve as the principal servants of Mammon beside Hamatula. They run the layers of hell, occasionally banding together as inquisitors to root out heresy and compel hesitant Batezu into battle. When deployed to mortal realms, under the command of dictators and tyrants, their keen ability to detect disloyalty and incompetence, no matter how slight, becomes evident. As the only Batezu with authority over those of higher rank, Asalus are widely despised. Their power to punish offenders, including sending them to the pit of flame on Phlegethos for 101 days of agonizing torment before their return, provokes resentment and fear among other devils. Despite the risk of retaliation, Asalus uphold their duty with unwavering resolve, ensuring the preservation of Batezu law and order. However, if a criminal attempts to kill an Asaluth and is apprehended, a much more severe punishment awaits. The assailant will be transformed into a lemur and branded with a mark indicating permanent prohibition from promotion. Such lemurs are universally reviled by all other Batezu. While Ocelus are commonly believed to be agents of the pit fiends, regardless of the accuracy of this belief, their authority to discipline higher-ranking Batezu ends with them. On the River Styx, due to the Morenolos refusal to participate in the blood war, the task of navigating the river sometimes falls to the Ocelus, who have endeavored to master its twists and turns. However, historical records from Beator often attempt to conceal the fact that entire fleets have been lost in the past due to waterfalls, whirlpools, and rocks when an Ocelus steering the navy made a wrong turn or misinterpreted a sign from the river. Ultimately, the devils rely on Yugoloths for safe passage. Regarding spellcasting, they possess the mental acuity necessary to learn wizardry, often utilizing divination magic to aid them in their duties, although only a select few bother to pursue magical studies. Another avenue of magical pursuit for Ocelus is divine magic tied to a deity. While the overall number of Batezi priests is small, Ocelus constitute a significant fraction of them and are typically specialty priests. Ecologically, Ocelus, being denizens of Stygia, prefer cold environments over hot ones. Adapted to their chilling surroundings, they are capable of seeing into the ultraviolet spectrum. Biologically, they possess the ability to see in total darkness. Their most formidable natural weapon is their scorpion-like tails, which injects a potent, strength-sapping poison into their victim, quickly incapacitating them. Despite variations, there are common strategies employed by all devils in layer arrangement. Firstly, they heavily trap their layers ensuring that minions are aware of their locations to provide effective assistance. Secondly, they seek to restrict enemy movement, with military engineers skilled in constructing obstacles to funnel adversaries into vulnerable positions. Thirdly, devils in areas infused with Beator's magic 
aim to replicate terrifying sights from hell itself, unsettling non-natives and potentially impairing their combat effectiveness akin to a fear spell. Alarm systems, though not always magical, are also a common feature. Knowing they may retreat if victory seems unlikely, devil layers typically incorporate at least two escape routes. One route serves as a decoy, drawing attention and energy away from enemies, while the other is a heavily trapped secret passage intended for the devil's actual use. Additionally, they employ tactics to prevent enemies from fleeing, such as creating hazards like artificial rock sides to block potential escape routes. Following a battle, if a devil refrains from killing its enemies or is not outright defeated, prospects for the mortals involved are bleak. Typically, the fate of the devil's enemies falls into the following categories. Captured enemies are often handed over to chitons or excruciarchs for torture. While these devils specialize in tormenting souls, they also acquire mundane torture skills to enhance their marketability. Extracting information from captives is crucial, starting with details about local devilish plans and who else is aware of them. Subsequent interrogation delves into local power structures for purposes of infiltration and blackmail. Desired intelligence ranges from concrete details like fortress layouts and military assets to scandals involving corruptible individuals. Torture sessions often lead to a devil offering the captive a pact, typically in the form of a Faustian bargain. The initial offer is to end the torture in exchange for cooperation. Acceptance does not automatically consign the captive's soul to the devil, as decisions made under duress can be contested in Beator. However, captives who refuse the deal are subjected to escalating incentives to agree. Another devil is often dispatched to negotiate a ransom with the captive's relatives or associates, offering their soul or material wealth in exchange for freedom. Devils aim for a scenario where the captive relinquishes their soul for freedom, while the contracted party forfeits theirs for the captive's release. It is customary for captives to be rendered incapable of posing a threat to the devils, typically through written contracts binding their souls to Beator if they attempt to oppose devils or their allies. In extreme cases, this may involve physical mutilation or madness. Despite their tendency toward vindictiveness, devils don't always retaliate when defeated, even upon returning to Beator. While setbacks generally trigger a desire for vengeance, Due to the risk of demotion and the need to deter sabotage, devils may choose not to act if the setback is minor. However, the likelihood of retaliation increases with the importance of the disrupted plan. If initiating or expanding a vengeance operation proves detrimental to their larger goals, devils may give up on their plans for retribution. Retaliation serves to deter others from opposing devils, often executed through minions and overt killings to make a public statement. Fair fights are not valued. Instead, targets are often attacked while asleep with retention-grabbing methods. To underscore the deterrent aspect, devils indiscriminately target bystanders of any age, profession, or health. Attacks may occur multiple times, initially as a means of testing the target's strength before a final assault. While assassination is the most common method, devils may employ lethal traps or poisoning to eliminate targets. Gathering intelligence on target whereabouts is crucial. Mortal minions provide information openly where possible, while magical means may be employed in more clandestine situations. If targets remain elusive, devils may resort to extortion, kidnapping individuals of importance, or staging phantom killings to draw them out. In some cases, public pressure from fearful citizens may also force targets out into the open. Devil society's economy revolves primarily around souls, which provide energy to their realm. Mortals are corrupted while alive, ensuring their souls are bound for Beator upon death. Once deceased, souls are collected and subjected to torture to extract magical energy. Once depleted, the soul is reincarnated as Lemur, joining infernal society. While souls are paramount, devils also utilize money, precious metals, and other goods for trade, albeit with no intrinsic value placed on these items. They are valued solely for their ability to acquire more souls. Money is used to fund devil operations on the material plane, including financing cults, bribing officials, hiring services such as assassinations, and purchasing goods. Devils may offer mortals their services in exchange for money, information, or magic. Funds acquired are funneled back to Beator, where they are distributed or used for personal projects, earning credits that may lead to promotion. When a devil successfully corrupts a mortal, the soul arrives in Beator upon death bearing a unique mark that credits the devil with its corruption. 
accumulating these credits forms the basis for a devil's promotion. Alternatively, they can earn credits by providing Beator with material goods, although this method is not as esteemed as soul acquisition. Nonetheless, ambitious devils seeking to enhance their resume often pursue any avenue possible. Promotion involves a devil transitioning to a higher form, a decision made by its superior and subject to reversal by even higher ranking authorities. Intervention in promotions within the least devil status is rare due to its perceived insignificance. Promotion to any lesser devil status requires the approval of the promoted devil's greater devil superior, while advancement to greater devil status necessitates the agreement from the arch devil served by the promoted devil. If uncertain about their superior, devils default to reporting to Asmodeus. Ascending to the status of a unique devil requires arch devil approval, while becoming a normal duke only requires being a pit fiend. Promotion to arch devil status requires Asmodeus's consent. Promotion criteria prioritize loyalty to superiors over job performance. Devils value subordinates who are competent yet pose no threat to their superior's position. High-ranking devils maintain relatively few subordinates to prevent treasonous activities. Aided by the ability afforded by such promotions, which require significant power harvested from souls. Typically, promotions occur when positions become vacant due to death or demotion. Some devils attempt to expedite vacancies, a risky endeavor punished by death. Alternatively, devils may await promotions. Successful devils often achieve frequent promotions, sometimes creating new positions to fill managerial roles. Every devil possesses the authority to demote its subordinates. Asmodeus holds the power to demote any devil at will. While an archdevil can demote any devil with a line of authority back to the archdevil seeking demotion, greater or lesser devils are only permitted to demote those under their direct command. Demotions are typically punitive measures rather than arbitrary decisions. Demotion to an upper ebo is the most dreaded punishment. However, there is one non-punitive reason for demotion to free up energy for other purposes. Devils whose operations falter may demote subordinates to harvest additional energy, motivating devils to work diligently. A unique form of demotion within infernal society is known as lateral demotion. Certain forms within the hierarchy, although technically high ranking, are unpopular among devils due to their emphasis on physical power or mental acumen. Devils generally aspire to positions where intellect outweighs physical strength. Being assigned to such forms is considered a lateral demotion. These serve various purposes. Firstly, there is occasionally a genuine need for physically robust servants. Secondly, it allows a superior to temporarily sideline problematic subordinate, often used against suspected traitors. This tactic enables a superior to either confirm suspicions and eliminate the traitor, or attract the demotion if the suspicions are later proven unfounded, providing a plausible justification for their actions. While begrudgingly accepted, it is generally acknowledged as an excuse. As previously mentioned, devils highly prize mortal souls and relentlessly strive to influence mortals towards a lawful evil outlook. When a mortal dies in this state, their soul is claimed by Beator, and a devil responsible for this ideological shift receives credit. Often when a devil successfully alters a mortal's outlook, it orchestrates the individual's demise. This serves two purposes. It ensures the soul's immediate journey to Beator, securing the devil's credit, and prevents the possibility of the mortal's ideology shifting again, potentially diverting their soul elsewhere and depriving the devil of credit later. However, on a larger scale, devils recognize the utility of mortals. They facilitate the ideological transformation of their peers and advance other infernal agendas on the prime material plane for Beator. Hence, devils must obtain permission for each instance of moral termination to send their soul to Beator. Various methods exist for devils to accrue credits. Most souls arriving in Beator are not swayed by devils, but possess a lawful evil disposition from the start. Devils establish hunting grounds across prime territories, each overseen by a designated devil titled Under Controller or Factotum. This coveted assignment is bestowed upon those favored by the archdevils and entails crediting all the souls arriving in Beator without an existing devil's influence to the Under Controller. The Under Controller serves to mediate conflicts between devils vying for patrol of particularly lucrative hunting grounds. In such instances, they ensure the turf remains under the control of their direct superior. Infighting often arises between mortals and lesser devils when two Under Controllers are assigned to the same hunting ground by different superiors. 
typically as a means of disciplining troublemakers. The rationale is that if the troublemaker perishes in the turf war, it resolves the issue. Or if they succeed in securing the hunting ground, it results in an increase in souls for Beator, enhancing the superior's standing. The second responsibility of an under-controller is to ensure that a lawful evil society maintains its ideological alignment or shifts further towards lawful evil tendencies. This is achieved through the manipulation of customs and regulations within their designated hunting grounds. Societies exhibiting characteristics such as unconditional respect for authority, the establishment of a police state enforcing laws with severe penalties, maintenance of brutally honest records, and the exemption of rulers from these rules are likely under the effective control of the responsible devil. Additional indicators include the collective thinking that discriminates against or antagonizes minorities, along with the belief in the superiority of their system and the necessity to impose it on others. As they have an infinite lifespan, they are capable of executing plans over extended periods until desired societal modification is accomplished. Undercontrollers often adopt a hands-off approach and are frequently absent from the prime material plane. They delegate portions of their assigned territory to their most loyal subordinates, retaining the richest areas for themselves. These territories may be further subdivided and distributed among lower-ranking devils when sufficiently large. Faustian packs are regarded as the most potent tool in the devil's arsenal for corrupting mortals. While copies are provided for both parties, the devil only relinquishes the mortal's copy when pressed. The mortal's signature is sealed in blood. There are two types of contracts made with mortals, known among devils as Pact Certain and Pact Insidious, terms deemed too ominous for mortal ears. The Pact Certain is favored by devils for its expediency. Upon signing, the mortal immediately forfeits their soul to Beator upon death in exchange for services. Unless evidence of coercion, such as threats of torture, is provided, these contracts are virtually impossible to contest. The Pact Insidious differs slightly. Here, a mortal and devil agree to exchange services. The devil provides the mortal with something, and in return, the mortal must perform certain actions desired by the devil. Multiple subsequent contracts may be made, offering additional benefits to the mortal in exchange for further compliance. Failing to adhere to the specified actions results in the mortal forfeiting the benefits of the contract. While agreeing to a pact insidious does not inherently bind one's soul to Beator, fulfilling the contract's terms bring one closer to Beator upon death. Mortals are forbidden from discussing the contract's contents with others, as stipulated in a clause present in every pact insidious. The benefits offered by a devil to a mortal are assessed based on the probability of the mortal soul reaching Beator upon death. Those less likely to do so could negotiate more favorable terms, whereas those likely to reach Beator without a deal had less leverage. Devils have limited resources, so they calculate what they can offer to entice a mortal to sell their soul. In addition to the likelihood of entering Beator, the influence or power held by the mortal to be corrupted also increases the value of their soul. This includes political power, such as royalty or individual power, like that of an experienced adventurer, both of which can secure better terms than a weaker beggar. The benefits a mortal can receive from a contract with the devil are those the devil can provide through various means. This could involve providing information through a network of spies, acquiring wealth through contracted raiders, or benefiting from infernal cultists' insider trades. Actual magical assistance from the devil is rare and only provided when mundane means are insufficient. In such cases, an archdevil might be petitioned to perform a miracle for the mortal. A mortal can legally challenge a devil's claim to their soul under certain conditions. Those coerced into a contract or if a devil failed to fulfill their end of a bargain. However, this could only occur after the mortal's death upon their soul reaching Beator. Devils make no effort to inform mortals of this right. When invoked, a fair trial is held, with the mortal being provided an advocate. The mortal could appoint their own advocate, but the burden falls on them to contact the individual. The advocate faced opposition from a devil arguing for the soul's damnation, with the pit fiend often serving as judge. While it is possible for a mortal to win their case, they might still be required to enter Beator based on their moral and ethical beliefs. One avenue for a mortal soul to enter Beator was through devil worship. Worshiping a devil guarantees entry to Beator upon death. Typically, devil worshippers pledge themselves to a single archdevil, occasionally to a greater devil. These cults serve as a means for devils to advance their agendas on the material plane. Devil-worshipping cults are categorized as revealed cults and hidden cults. 
A revealed cult is not necessarily public, but its members are fully aware that they worship a devil, specifically an archdevil. In contrast, a hidden cult operates with only a select inner circle knowing about the object of worship. New recruits are gradually indoctrinated as they ascend the hierarchy, with members of the inner circle feeling obligated to conceal the truth from lower ranking members. Upon death, a normal soul typically goes to the fugue plane. However, due to an agreement with Kellen Vore, devils are permitted to negotiate with souls during the interim period for their claim by their deity servants. Devils offer souls the option to change their final destination to Beator. Some souls accept out of fear of their own god's judgment and punishment, enduring torture in Beator before being reborn as Lemurs. Souls can also negotiate additional benefits, such as ensuring their bereaved families are cared for or securing an early promotion from Lemur status. The Devil Society revolves around two main activities, harvesting souls for energy and battling in the Blood War. Avernus serves as the primary battleground for this conflict. Engaging in the Blood War is a career path available to all Devils, exempting them from meeting soul quotas and still allowing for promotions based on military achievements. There exists a rivalry between Soul Harvesters and Blood War veterans. The former claims superiority, arguing that their harvest energy enables the latter to fight, while the latter assert that their importance is for ensuring that the leisure to harvest souls is safeguarded by their military efforts. Among unique devils, only Bell remains consistently involved in the Blood War, as other devils find it necessary but not sufficiently interesting. The devil's key objective in the Blood War is to defend Beator from demon incursions, with the pivotal battleground being the first layer. Beator's magical condition prevents demons from teleporting between layers, requiring them to conquer one layer at a time and re-consecrate it before advancing. By safeguarding Avernus, the devils impede the demon's progress. Devils engage in various hobbies, such as indulging in fine food and drink. While they cannot experience intoxication or alter their minds with substances, they occasionally consume magical alternatives. Examples include guhalaki, a hallucinogenic concoction made from fiendish giant centipedes, infernal wine derived from fire grapes, and screecher, a substance with a numbing effect on low-ranking devils. The consumption of mind-altering substances is generally frowned upon and forbidden. These substances are typically distributed as rewards and used in rituals. High-ranking devils have the privilege of partaking in such substances regularly, although this is seen as hypocritical given their prohibition to subordinates. Certain deities reside within Beator. Although conflicts occasionally arise between infernal forces and those of evil gods, these skirmishes typically do not escalate to the scales of the battles between Beator and the Abyss. This is largely because Beator and the deities share a common enemy in the forces of good, while their own conflict is considered a secondary priority. Ultimately, devils view gods, even those of lawful evil alignment, not as entities deserving of deference, but rather as targets for destruction, albeit not of immediate concern. Devils possess a variety of forms, but they all share a unique organ known as the ovatorium. This organ resembles a mushy and white mass and comprises sacs containing miniature versions of devil forms. Upon promotion, wherein a devil transforms into a specific form, the contents of the corresponding sac expand until they burst through the skin of the old form, completing the promotion. Many devils possess the ability to see in complete darkness, while they can perceive through magical darkness, like that of deeper darkness, their sensory experience is tinged with a destructive and despairing quality. For instance, even a healthy flower will appear wilted to them. They can discern differences in smells, such as between a cesspit and fine perfume, but their perception registers these differences not in terms of pleasantness, but rather in degrees of unpleasantness. Although devils do not require sustenance, they are capable of eating and drinking. For some, indulging in fine food and drink serves as a hobby, while for others, consuming the flesh of their enemies is a demonstration of power and dominance. The edibility of devil flesh remains uncertain. Some adventurers in Faerun have claimed to have sampled it, but the validity of their accounts is questionable. It is plausible that such consumption may have contributed to their mental instability, though this cannot be definitively confirmed. The vast majority of devils originate as deceased mortals transformed into lemurs. Sexual reproduction among devils is highly uncommon due to infertility of female devils, with rare exceptions like Brachinas and Arignes. 
Male devils can father half fiends with mortals. Unique devils, both male and female, do possess fertility, and offspring between them result in unique devils as well. However, such instances are rare due to the inherent danger posed by powerful offspring potentially turning against their parents. Another group of devils spontaneously emerges from various parts of Beator. Fallen angels make up another distinct category, exemplified by Arrhenius. In general, sexuality is more of a leisure activity among devils, particularly favored by the powerful. A devil that perishes on Beator experiences true death. Outside of Beator, a deceased devil undergoes a transformation into a slimy substance over a span of three to nine minutes. Although mildly poisonous, this substance is not lethal if consumed. Upon death on Beator, the devil returns fully healed in the form it was slain in, but it takes 99 years to regain its former form. Often lower ranking devils face the motion following death. They possess eternal life and youth. Any appearance of ill health indicates a curse, supernatural ailment, or disruption in their supply of divine energy. Suffocation is a viable method to kill them, as they still require minimal amounts of oxygen to survive. Asmodeus harbors a deep-seated animosity towards the gods of the upper plains, resentful of their apparent abandonment and shouldering the burden of the blood war alone. Once he regains his full strength, he plans to negotiate a peace treaty with demonkind, seeking a temporary truce to redirect the conflict from internal strife to a decisive clash between good and evil. His ultimate aim is to bring ruin to the celestial realms overseen by the gods, ensuring their suffering in the process. However, his ambitions extend beyond the cessation of the blood war and the subjugation of demonkind. He is determined to seize control of the heart of the abyss, thereby gaining the power necessary to dominate the entire demon race and challenge the authority of all other deities. He may even contemplate absorbing the essence of law from the multiverse upon attaining his full potential, plunging the planes into cosmic disorder. Upon achieving victory in the Blood War, he envisions conquering the remaining lawful planes, establishing himself as the undisputed ruler of all reality. After all, it was you, it was me. Let me please introduce myself. I'm a sage of great power and taste. And I laid traps for adventurers who died before they saw their face. Pleased to meet you. 
hope you guess my name. What's confusing you is just the nature of my game. Just as every thief has his cloak and all heroes face their end. Just call me as Modius for I am in need of some friends. So if you meet me, have some courtesy, have some sympathy, use your brain. Use your well-learned lore, I'll slay your soul to waste, oh yeah. Pleased to meet you, hope you guessed my name. What's confusing you is just the nature of 